you listen. No matter where we are or who we are, you are the one who listens. You give us a great gift in your unconditional love and your willingness to be present to us. Now, God, we open ourselves to you in this time of worship. And may these words be an offering to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, a letter was written to an insurance company. And this is the letter. Dear sir or ma'am, I am writing in response to your request for more information concerning my injuries. I trust the following will be sufficient. I am a bricklayer by trade, and on the date of injuries, I was working alone laying brick around the top of a four-story building when I realized that I had about 500 pounds of brick left over. Rather than carry the brick down by hand, I decided to put them in a barrel and lower them by a pulley which was fastened to the top of the building. I secured the end of the rope at ground level and went to the top of the building, loaded the bricks in the barrel, and flung the barrel out. I then went down and untied the rope, holding it securely to ensure the slow descent of the barrel. As you will note, in block six of the insurance claim, I weigh 145 pounds. <laughs> Due to the shock of being jerked off the ground so swiftly, I lost my presence of mind and forgot to let go of the rope. Between the second and third floor, I met the barrel coming down. This accounts for the bruises and lacerations on my upper body. Regaining my presence of mind, I again held tightly to the rope and proceeded rapidly up the side of the building, not stopping until my right hand jammed in the pulley. This accounts for my broken thumb. Despite the pain, I retained my presence of mind and held tightly to the rope. At approximately the same time, however, the barrel of bricks hit the ground and the bottom fell out of the barrel. Devoid of weight, the, uh, the barrel now weighed about 20 pounds. I again refer you to block number six on the form and my weight. As you would guess, I began a rapid descent. In the vicinity of the second floor, I met the barrel coming up. This explains the injuries to my legs and lower body. Slowed only slightly, I continued my descent, landing on the pile of bricks. Fortunately, my back was only sprained and the internal injuries were minimal. I am sorry to report, however, that at that point, I again lost my presence of mind and let go of the rope. As you can imagine, the empty barrel caused a few more lacerations as it came down on my head. I trust that this answers your concerns, sincerely yours. A bad day. <laughs> a really bad day. We've all had them. A physical ailment, spiritual brokenness, an emotional distress, an encounter with a barrel. But Jonah was having more than a bad day. This was more than just kind of a rough spot. This was more than a little bump in the road. This was a really bad day. And the author of the story, the one who put this down on paper, uses every writing technique available to him to communicate just how bad a day it was, to, to illustrate the pain and the loneliness that, that Jonah would have felt, feeling distant from God. It's amazing how an author can use different images and illustrations to communicate that. In the summer of 2002, nine coal miners were trapped in Pennsylvania 240 feet below ground. Just imagine, just imagine 
what that would have been like. Absolute darkness, cut off from everyone, water rising, bitterly cold temperatures, cold to to the very core of who you were, a wave of utter despair coming over you. That was the language those coal miners used later after the rescue to describe that experience. And though none of us, at least as far as I know, none of us have been in that exact situation, have known literally what it is like to be a coal miner trapped below ground, I think the the experience they described is universal. That sense of being trapped, that feeling of hopelessness, being completely terrified and not knowing what's going to happen next. The story of Jonah and how the storyline continues, it's amazing how at the beginning of chapter two, there is this, this descent, this continual descent throughout the chapter, this description of a feeling abandoned, this feeling of loneliness, this utter despair. And, and the author uses the language of the sea. Throughout the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, the sea is a, is a metaphor, an image for utter chaos. And, and just the way the author of Jonah goes on to describe it, being tangled up, you, you just almost feel like you're there. But it doesn't end there. All of a sudden, Jonah is swallowed by a great fish, this, this giant fish that takes him down even more rapidly than he had been going before. When this guy, Jonah, thought it, it couldn't get any worse, when he thought his descent was just about down as far as he could go, all of a sudden the fish comes along, grabs him and takes him deeper and deeper and deeper. Back in 1986, I went with a group of, of college students to Colorado. We were gonna go and promote the university that we were a part of. Though we had a half day to go and mess around. And we went to Red Rock. And there we were going to just do some hiking, some playing around. And well, there was with us a, how do I put this? A very attractive co ed. And all the guys there noticed her. And being the mature individuals that we were, we decided to show off. I followed suit. And I was on a boulder and thought, I'm gonna leap to that other boulder. And my takeoff was good. The landing, not so much. And I stumbled off that boulder and went sliding down the side of a very steep hill, cliff, whatever language you wanna use. And I went over rock and cacti and a yucca plant on my way down to the bottom. And when I hit, I was just kind of this crumpled mess. My friends, they took a different path, the easy path down to find me there. And I was just kind of laying there and had a, had a cut and elbow was pretty banged up. And oh man, I didn't think it could get any worse. One of my friends offered me a hand and I kind of picked myself up and brushed myself off. And that cute co-ed proceeded to point out that I had ripped the back out of my jeans. <laughs> you think you've hit rock bottom only to discover, no, you can go down a little further. <laughs> all joking aside though, I'm guessing we've all been there thinking, oh my goodness, this is as lousy as it can get. This is as bad as it can get. Oh no. No, it can go even a little further. And hitting rock bottom, being trapped like those miners, being stuck in the waters of chaos and being swallowed by a giant fish and being taken down. From, I think we all know what is meant 
in those kinds of experience. The Hebrew people, they wrote beautiful poetry and wonderful, wonderfully and creative stories to, to try to communicate to others what was difficult to communicate. They knew hopelessness, they knew despair, they knew brokenness, they knew what was hitting rock bottom and then having that rock bottom collapse and them even fall further. They knew those experiences and they tried to put language to it. And I think too often we in modern times get into these debates over whether the story of Jonah should be taken literally or not. Did it happen exactly that way or not? And we get into these arguments and debates and we miss the point. We miss the point of what's trying to be communicated here. And when we're willing to get away from that and read the story, what I think so often happens, we find ourselves nodding because we know it. We've never been in the belly of a fish, but we've been in the belly of the fish. We know what it is like to be in the waters of chaos and life going crazy and and all of a sudden something grabbing us and even taking us further and further into the deep, into that isolation and that loneliness and despair. But even there, in that place that appears beyond rescue, even there in that place that Jonah describes as Sheol, the place of death, Even there, Jonah cries out. There he cries out to God, and what we discover is that no depth is too deep, no place too distant, no situation too hopeless, no circumstance too futile. For God never lost track of Jonah, and God never loses track of us as well. We cry out in our despair, and sometimes it feels as if our cries, our prayers echo out into nothingness, and they are not heard. But we can be, we can be convinced that when we cry out to God, God hears, and God responds, and God will be present to us in ways that we probably cannot even begin to imagine. And though that presence may not solve the problem, God's presence may not come and correct it immediately. There's something about about knowing that when we are in the belly of the fish, going deep, that we're not alone, that God is there. Paul Moore was the Episcopal Bishop in New York for a couple of decades, an amazing man. But in 1973, his wife Jenny died of colon cancer. And he describes just the pain associated with that and the tears and coming and finding a friend and crying with him. And finally, he describes crying out to God and crying out into the emptiness but finding something. And that's where the title of his autobiography came, Presences. Not presents, like a gift, but presences. Discovering in the midst of that, of that cry, in the, time of that, in, in the midst of that searching, that God was present to him. Sometimes it is hard to imagine. Sometimes when we're in the waters of chaos and and we find ourselves even going deeper, it's hard to imagine that anybody can hear us, let alone God. But Jonah, whether he believed it or not, cried out and he was heard. He cried out and found God present to him. Nearly two years ago, I got a phone call. A member of my congregation was calling. He was at the hospital. We knew his wife had been struggling with health concerns, but we thought she was improving. But she had died. And he just wanted me to know. I I said, I'll, I'll be there as soon as I can. I ran out of the office, got my car, drove the 20 minutes to the hospital. I got in there and There he sat in the hospital room in a chair. They had just taken her body out. 
he got up and he embraced me. And he said, I w- I've been thinking this day might come. And the struggling and the hurt, I just, I felt so alone. And then when she died, he said, when she died, I felt like I had been abandoned by God. And about the moment I was going to respond to that comment, he said, then the chaplain came in and prayed a beautiful prayer. And as he left, the nurse came in and she just sat there and held my hand for a while. And then the phone rang and it was one of the members of the church just calling to check in, not knowing what had happened. And when I told him, his heart just broke. And then he shared a story about my wife that just meant so much to hear. And then you came. In those moments of desperation, In those moments when we think we've hit rock bottom and we discover we can still fall further. When we're in the waters of chaos and all of a sudden we're grabbed and pulled down even faster and it feels like crying out, screaming out is going to be worthless. We can trust that crying out to God will get a response. We can trust the one who in the story of Jonah, in the stories of the prophets, in the story of Jesus, we find a God that hears and responds. We hear about a God that looks at every depth, looks at every situation and circumstance and says, it is not beyond redemption. It is not beyond God's ability. And we discover a God who responds and is present to us with a presence that is powerful and healing and hope-filled. Will you pray with me? Mighty God, mighty not on earthly terms, but in the sheer tenacity of your spirit to find us, to rescue us, to embrace us, even when we feel as though the distance is simply too great for even you, Lord, you are the one who never gives up. You are persistent in your presence. And even when our circumstance doesn't allow us to perceive your presence, we pray that that we will be able to trust that you are there. And somehow in faith, in believing, we begin to see these little glimpses of you coming alongside us. In our sadness, in our suffering, in our loneliness, you hear our cry and come to us with a love that enfolds us and embraces us. But God, we know that we are not simply called to to be the people who receive that gift, but you call us also to be agents by which those cries, those prayers are answered. So God, when we see someone who is hitting rock bottom, whose life appears to be in utter chaos, we pray, God, that you will will give us the words, that you will give us what is needed to come alongside that person and not to try to solve their problems or or give them that, that right pithy response, but that we can embody your grace and your love in the midst of their brokenness. God, we know that you are calling us to be those people, but not just because we can, but because so many of us have been there. We have been the ones who have hit rock bottom. We are the ones that have found ourselves floundering in the waters of chaos and then sucked even further down. And yet we have found that you are faithful that you are the one that comes alongside us and will never leave our side. God, we are thankful for who you are and for your willingness to be our God no matter the situation 
or the circumstance. We offer these words in the name of Jesus. Amen.